Welcome all of my indigenous warriors and friends out there. Welcome to Red Hoop Talk. You've made it to the 73rd episode of Red Hoop Talk, which is produced by the Association on American Indian Affairs, serving Indian country uh, since before we knew it would be called Indian country. <laughs> A hundred years ago, actually, back in 1922, the association um, got its start working on protecting Pueblo land rights. So what's going on today? Red Hoop Talk. Uh, I guess I should introduce myself. <laughs> My name is Shannon O'Loughlin. And I'm a citizen of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, and I'm coming to you live from the original homelands of the Piscataway peoples, uh, what other people call uh, Maryland, uh, just north of the head of the serpent, what I like to call Washington, D.C. Uh, we hope to hear from all of you that are watching this on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube. Um, give us a shout out in the chat. In the chat, let us know what nation uh, you come from or whose lands you're standing on. Uh, say hello and feel free to ask us questions. Um, we have a really special show. I'm I'm excited. All my staff are excited about our show today. Um, but before we go there, I have to first recognize that. See these earrings? I wore these earrings in our last show. Feel free to go back and check out show number 72. Um, these earrings are from Indicity, in I-N-D-I dash city, C-I-T-Y. Google them, check them out. My staff forced me to wear these earrings again tonight. I don't know why. I think they think if I keep wearing these earrings and say Indus City and go to Indus City, that maybe Indus City will send us free earrings or something. <laughs> so um, this is a blatant shout out that Colleen Medicine and Kim Smith and Shauna Shackleton, they all want Indus City earrings. And so uh, for what it's worth, there you go. There's the big um, uh, big plug for this evening, a little bit of capitalism to just, you know, add an extra spice to our conversation this evening. So let's get warmed up here for our 73rd episode and our special guest this evening, um, which is Klee Banali. He's from the Diné Nation. And he is an activist, a musician, a filmmaker, an artist, an organizer, and an anarchist. Um, he wears many hats and he's done a lot of great work. Now, usually I start the show off talking a little bit about uh, some news that's happened in the last week or um, things that we want to focus our attention on. What I'd like to do um, this evening is a little bit different in order to introduce you to our special guest for this evening. I want to play some music for you. Um, um, music always is this kind of direct and electrical charge for me. Um, and um, it tends to kind of quiet my mind and connect me with heart and spirit um, in, in a good way, even, even through pain and through anger. Music has always been something very special to me. And I, I'd kind of like to share some music with you from Klee um, and also featuring Sage Bond. Um, it's from their band, Appropriation. It's from Klee's band, Appropriation. And the song's called Nothing For Ourselves. I think it'll set the tone for us tonight uh, for the show. And um, let's just get started. Uh, right now, as I do my my uh, never able to share very smoothly, <laughs> um, here we go. Let's let's get this started, and then we'll bring on Clee.
in between crimson canyon walls, echoes of our lives unfolding, carved so generations can know that the cycle can be broken. is the wretched of the earth, understanding the trauma of the land. We are so deeply connected, more than we think we understand. I know it's hard, but you're not alone. Just meet me halfway, and we'll end this cycle. We'll pry it up from its fucking room. Uh, I got too into it. Okay. Um, welcome, uh, Mr. Clay Benali. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I got a little bit too into it there for a minute. Um, uh, thanks for being with us. And and thank you for that music, Clee. Um, I've spent a lot of time on your YouTube channel listening. And um, I, I, I like punk music. I like, I like anger. I like expressing. I, I'm a, you know, um, I'm not a musician or a singer, but I'm so grateful to to learn about you and and see your music and see your appropriation album. But let me stop there. Um, thank you, thank you for being with us, Clee. And please feel free to introduce yourself to everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She cle dash a jinne, twitch eat ni shabashish chi na kudina dashanella, shama a beatha chi auto beatha chi dash a chi, tithajin de na sha auto, da you see conflinish a whole one. My name is Klee Benali, originally from Black Mesa on the Diné or Navajo Nation, and currently I reside here in occupied Kinflana or so called Flagstaff, Arizona. 
at the base of De Coslit or the Holy San Francisco peaks. Yeah. Clee, you've got a long list. You have been organizing and um, uh, being an activist in the forefront of so many um, sacred places, uh, protecting sacred places and resisting development in so many places. The list of websites I have that you are uh involved in is immense. And we're going to share all of those websites um, tonight so you can get to know uh, Clee better and so you can get to know um, the important issues that he's working on um, and others like Clee are working on. Um, how did you get started, Clee, in, in, in being such a strong um, vocal activist on sacred place work? Did that have to do with growing up at, at Black Mesa? Um, and just being Navajo and, and what you've had to deal with at Navajo um, with uh, environmental um, racism. Um, well, it goes beyond just environmental racism, but um, thank you again for welcoming me onto the show first. I really appreciate it and um, excited to see if there's any engagement and comments and uh, interchange. Uh, I came prepared with some questions for you too. So, <laughs> um, but uh, one, I feel uneasy being labeled a, an activist sometimes because um, I think the uh, idea of activism is about campaigns and, you know, it has sort of become a niche product of a nonprofit industrial complex where folks uh, really, see a specialized role of people who are taking action in their communities to address issues. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm less interested in activities uh, and, and more interested in a, a principled way of life that embodies action for justice, for healing in our communities. So I, I sort of see myself as, as a healer or a caregiver, uh, not in the, the sense, you know, of. Um, you know, our Hatafis, like my father is a traditional medicine practitioner. So he asked where I come from and sort of the responsibilities that I have in, in the sense of duty or uh, responsibility to, to care and to take action when I see justice happening. A lot of that comes from that. You know, we, um, our, our teachings are to look at the root cause of something that is uh, causing harm and see what we can do. And so, I know. Before, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you, but you're, um, I'm hearing the, um, the feedback on your mic again um, tonight. Um, if anyone else out there is hearing um, interference in Clee's mic, could you let me know in the chat? Um, if I'm the only one here hearing it, then that's one thing. But if everyone else is hearing it, um, you know, please let me know if, if the sound quality is okay out there. Um, friends, I see Kim, you're out there. Can you let me know if the sound is okay? Sorry about that, Clea. I didn't mean to. Could be my voice too. I am, uh, and I should, you know, let everybody know that I'm currently uh, in isolation quarantine because I'm COVID positive, and so is my partner, and so my voice sounds a little rough uh, because your, your voice is fine it's, it's the interference yeah. coming from your mic no. so i don't know if your your computer or so, there's some kind of interference with um your mic um output right. um or input is it, is it still funky yes yeah. all right um yeah my settings are should be all okay i don't see anything different yeah J jd says it's it's like a sounds like a broken speaker so, you know, when you have that kind of um, garbled oh, okay. kind of sound. So really bad. Yeah, so. it, like, it's almost like you could have a filter on it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, nothing in my settings have changed, so I apologize for that. Um, That's okay. We'll work through it. And... Um, um, yeah, I don't... It's still, yeah, it's still there. Um, let's see, we could go. Well, let me um, 
Let me talk about um, and share some of the, while Clee is working on a sound, let me share some of the um, organizations or really um, um, uh, that are, are really doing some, some incredible work and there's some great um, content. Um, the first thing is um, I want to take you all to um, indigenousaction.org. Um, so let me pull this up on the share screen. And um, this is a great website. You got to get in there and look around. Um, there are so many good things to read and educate yourself about um uh, with uh, with the work that uh that Clee and others are doing uh to protect sacred places uh among other things so please um hit indigenousaction.org another um place where you can learn more about the issues we're going to talk about tonight <laughs> i love i love the um appropriate appropriate in hell. <laughs> I, I love that image. Um, uh, let's see, we've got um, the Kintani or Flagstaff Mutual Aid. Uh, this is work that Clee's been involved in uh, uh, regarding uh, COVID and providing support um, uh, for COVID at, at Navajo Nation. And Clee, how's your sound doing? Um, I uh, just closed a few things and I'm checking the speed with my internet. Nothing seems to be interfering and my setup sound, is the same. So yeah, you me. sound perfect now. You sound perfect. Strange. All right. Well, we'll, we'll proceed. And if it comes up, okay. then. did I mess anything up yet so far talking about, um, Kintani, uh, mutual aid or indigenous action? It's an invoice. Now, so it's Kintani, but yeah, Thank you. um, Thank you. No, oh, no, I, I appreciate it. And, and this is like, you know, connecting to the song, uh, Nothing for Ourselves. The um, the quote comes from the Zapatistas, it's, as it's mentioned in that uh, music video. And um, this really, uh, you know, speaks to mutual aid and the idea of, of giving and offering. And, you know, part of the response to the COVID-19 pandemic was that so many folks uh, mobilized mutual aid, which is an anarchist principle, um, though it doesn't belong to anarchism because, you know, Peter K K Kropotkin, who is a, a Russian scientist, um, wrote a book back in the 1800s. And uh, I don't really care about, you know, dead white European minds, but he, he studied the natural world and studied uh, indigenous peoples, of course, and uh, looked at, you know, a contrast to social Darwinism and said that I don't think that societies and human humanity is based upon competition and those who dominate and are the strongest, you know, so he challenged uh, social Darwinism and asserted that mutuality is actually what he uh, saw happening more that helps uh, communities, natural, you know, and um, uh, um, different uh, species actually survive more. And so, you know, for, for, for Europeans, that was a revolutionary thought. Of course, for indigenous people, that's the way it is. And so um, the idea that the Zapatistas put forward is just like everything for everyone, nothing for ourselves, speaks to that idea of mutuality. Um, and as, as Dina and so many other indigenous people, we have different names uh, for that, um, which helps. But yeah, I mean, for me, it's, you know, responding to the COVID pandemic feels like an almost like a, a long-term ceremony where we have a constant giveaway, where we're making sure that those who are most vulnerable are taken care of. So the idea of radical redistribution of resources is one thing, but the other idea is addressing the um, also power, power relationships. How do we radically redistribute power when we see these imbalances in our world? And um, if I may get back to your first question about how did I get you know, active or activated and involved, regardless of my rant against uh, activism. <laughs> um, because, uh, you know, the point I was going to come to is, is that, you know, we have our, our specialized hatathlis or healers 
Uh, and this is how I was raised by my father with my brother, and my sister, who I played music in a band called Black Fire with for longer than I care to admit, over 20, 24, 25 years. Um, so what we just shared was a little bit of my solo expression, which, you know, I, I, um, I stopped playing music in 2012 or so, 2011, 12, when I realized a, bulldo a bulldozer wasn't going to be stopped by a guitar. Um, but I think we'll get into that later. Um, <laughs> uh, it's a, my long, sad story. But I was, um, uh, the area where my family comes from is an area called Big Mountain. And a lot of folks um, are aware of that struggle on Black Mesa because in 1974, U.S. Congress passed PL 93-531, which was also known as the Relocation Act. And that act was um, created and pushed forward under the guise that there was a political land dispute. And if Congress didn't intervene, there would be bloodshed between the Diné and the Hopi, our neighbors. And so this was a fabricated, you know, divide and conquer tactic though, that was created because underneath Black Mesa is one of the largest coal reserves in North America. And there was already a coal op company operating known as Peabody Coal Company. And there was a whole geopolitical design of resource extraction to pr take that coal, process it in coal-fired power plants and provide energy and water uh, to the greater part of the Southwest. So, you know, effectively um, mining uh, and exploiting and turning the Navajo Nation into a large battery, if you will, uh, for much of the development in the South, throughout the Southwest. And so um, this political dispute though, uh, that, you know, and I use quotes of dispute, um, passed and it led to the forced removal of now over 20,000 Diné people from our ancestral homelands. The land was divided. It was split between the Hopi for partition land on one side, Diné or Navajo partition land on another side. And my family's place, my dad's home, which, you know, we grew up initially with no running water, uh, no electricity um, with my brother and sister when we were in little diapers running around the res. And, um, the fence that was put in to divide the land between Diné and Hopi people went right through our sheep corral. It was right through our lands, separating our families, separating us from our ancestral springs and tearing families apart. And so my, my father, my mother, and my mother is, um, she's Russian Polish and she, um, she had just sort of left everything and moved up, um, up, you know, remotely in Black Mesa and helped to raise us there with our um, families, our aunties, and so forth. And they looked at this and they fought. You know, my uh, the matriarchs, Roberta Blackout, Catherine Smith, Pauline White Singer, Ruby Baikedi, ja um, Jenny Mini Beads. So many of these um, elder matriarchs stood up and they resisted. They fought. They said, "You're not going to remove us from our land because, as Pauline White Singer said, relocate. There's no word for relocation in our language." Relocation means to disappear, to move away, disappear, and never be seen again. So this is an act of genocide against our people. And so they fought, and they still continue to fight to this day, many of my relatives, even though many of the elders have passed on. And so I, I grew up, like one of the first <laughs> memories I have, there's actually a picture of me that was circulated of holding a sign in front of the, the relocation office that was located here in Occupied Flagstaff. And the sign said, BIA, Bureau of Indian Affairs, don't kill me, I'm only three. And um, I always, I, once in a while, I look at that that photo because I remember, I, I didn't know what was going on. My, my relatives just painted that sign for me and I was holding it, but we were there. We were holding it down and we were always dragged to different meetings. We were, you know, taken to different presentations and, um, you know, testi testimony in court and, and so forth. And um, that's what I was exposed to growing up. So that struggle is something that is very much part of me and shaped who I am, not to just listen to what, you know, the, the Washington or the government says, but the assertion of my elder matriarchs is that this is a sovereign denomination because we were abandoned by the, not only the federal government was attacking us because they want the resources as the way we saw it facilitating the geopolitical moves of these corporations, multinational corporations, to exploit Mother Earth, but also the tribal governments were complicit as well. 
they were put at odds and they abandoned the people on the land. So the assertion was that we're an autonomous area. The elders declared the sovereign to their nation saying, we don't, we don't see any of your laws because they're not the laws of creator. And my grandmother, Roberta Blacko, um, she had asserted that the only person that can relocate her was a creator. She always carried that sign. And if you look online, you'll see pictures of her with that sign. And I remember standing with her so many times, so many different uh, actions. Even when we, my brother and sister, we started playing music, we actually started playing music when we were 10 years old. And the first songs that we wrote were about relocation. They were about the struggle because what we saw being portrayed about our people in mainstream media was not what we were experiencing on the ground in our in our lives. And it didn't portray the suffering. It was just the narrative of, you know, this is a land dispute and this is an encroachment and Congress needs to be inter intervened and it. it was justified. But that's not what we saw. So we picked up our tools that we could communicate with um, were instruments, and thankfully my brother and sister, we all chose different instruments, otherwise you know, maybe we'd all been playing accordions or something. Um, <laughs> Please, yeah, so. uh, the sound is uh, freaking out again. Um, try it again. Uh, try, yeah, oh, no, try to, yeah, yeah, if you want to pull it's, up some of those websites. It's, it's doing know. the same thing again. It's It sounds a little rough. We can hear you. It's okay. just that, that that grumbling is happening um, while you're talking. So, um, yeah, I was going to ask you about your Polish background and where, where's the accordions at <laughs> in the polka. Um, uh, let's see. So, Klee, is, uh, Klee dropped off to see if he can fix his sound. Um, so, while he does that, um, oops, here he comes back. Let's see how we're doing. Hi. Mic check. Mic check. Sounds good. Okay. So yeah, so I was just I was just saying uh yeah, I was wondering about the accordion with your with the the Polish background whether uh, Oh, it's just a joke. No. Uh <laughs> we were punk rockers. I mean, we were raised um you know, exposed through the culture and through ceremony and all that. So, <laughs> you know, the connection that I have is like, you know, my, my father, uh, he, we had, we had to move around for work, um, and so forth. Like on one side, cause my dad had, um, about eight, uh, brothers, uh, and most of them worked at the mines. Um, I'd say all, almost all of them either worked in uranium mines or coal mines or sometimes alternated between both. Um, the, uh, the new uranium mine that they're trying to open up at the Grand Canyon, the, um, the Pinyon Plain mine is what they call it. Uh, two of my uncles actually helped to build um, the platforms for that. Uh, so I always say that I have a duty to undo their mess <laughs> and the destruction that they were causing. Um, but uh, so my my dad, you know, he, he didn't want to work there. And, um, you know, we would move and work. He would work at like a maintenance man at a campground, like the Grand Canyon. We lived there for a while. We lived here in occupied Flagstaff for a while in a little trailer and uh, just, you know, doing, he, he did maintenance or carpentry or construction work because he went to a boarding school when he was 20 years old, uh, Riverside, mm -hmm. California, and he was raised with no, you know, no English, no exposure to um, the out, outside as much necessarily until he was 20. So he was really culturally educated and um, as a practitioner. So then when he um, moved on from boarding school, then he just went and did the trades that he could. And so later on, my brother, my, my mom and dad met in actually California. Oh, wow. <laughs> and then, uh, they all moved back to the res and just raised us around Northern Arizona with their, their work. And we started doing um, uh, performances for tourists and traditional dances. So I actually have a deep experience uh, with an uncomfortable element of like culture as entertainment and a fetish mm -hmm. in some ways in that economy, the tourist economy here in the Southwest, which, you know, today I only dance at ceremonies. I don't dance again at, you know, for public or, or entertainment, unless it's for our own people for empowerment and education, just because I had that experience. And we used to dance at museums and tour all around. And, you know, it, it always felt like we were just, um, you know, a, a, a part of the scenery and 
part of that economy it was just to, to be used and nothing deeper than that to be appreciated especially because as we'll get into the desecration of our sacred lands if you know somebody's going to appreciate one component in the aesthetic but not go deeper than that and respect that which represent is represented through the dances through the expression through the cultural sharing the sacred our ways of being us as whole people then there's something completely disconnected and mm -hmm. to me that's always been part of the tension of where i try to apply myself in the struggle in the fight so that's a bit of where i come come from as a so-called activist but more of an advocate you know i would call myself or a, a caregiver caregiver i really like i really like that term um uh that's really appropriate um so um before we get into um maybe talking about san francisco peaks and your work there um there's a, a word being used a lot um lately appropriation and i i think you know with the pandemic um with the blm movement and and other things going on everyone is is really sensitized to whether or not they're appropriating um and even the association we get tons of 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 inquiries you know is this appropriation and am i appropriating and people don't even know if they're appropriating um can you talk a little bit about what you think appropriation is that maybe help help some folks out about whether they're doing it or not? Yeah, yeah. I, I was actually um, very intentional that I chose the name appropriation for the art project. It's not just a, a musical project. It's sort of like an art experience, which I, I don't know if I'll ever, ever really get to perform it live the way I'd like to, because I would like to make it actually a fat, theatrical production. Um, but, uh, you know, the idea of appropriation is taking without consent, very simply. Um, throughout existence, cultures have had meaningful exchanges. Um, that's just, in many ways, human nature, unless there's a dominating force that's just trying to control and exploit. And that is a relation, you know, a, a, an engagement, not a relationship of breaking consent. So, you know, meaningful exchanges means that we talk to each other, we share, we just like the Diné and Hopi here, that's why we say it's, there's a fictitious land dispute is because our, as our neighbors, we've had intermarriages, we've had ceremonies that have been shared, we have shared histories and so forth uh, um, of, of co, you know, uh, existence for generations upon generations. And so the, the, the idea of cultural appropriation is taking something from a culture and just using it uh, without any kind of consent, which is a violation. It's simple. So, you know, we, we usually get that sort of space where people are trying to figure out what where is the distinction between appreciation and appropriation. Well, that's not even a conversation to have if you're not c conversing with the people you're taking, you're sourcing, you're mining, you're extracting the cultural elements from. Uh, you know, this idea of the melting pot of the U.S. and the hom homogenization of, like, cultural aesthetics and so forth is an idea that really has sort of um, uh, been born out of destruction of people's own, own cultural identities because they've abused their uh, ways of being or they've, you know, destroyed them for so long. And, you know, that's not how we have healthy relationships and mutuality. It's about first is this okay? You know, hey, what kind of relationship do we have? So it's a very important discussion because nothing, you know, and I, I think this gets into mascotry, it gets into uh, representation, it gets into a range of issues with indigenous identity. And to me, what it comes down to is a factor of dehumanization because uh, you, you can't feel like it's okay to just take something to use for your own without consent unless you have dehumanized the other that you are taking from. And there's a factor that when, and how that relates to like a sacred land struggle, for example, is, is that, you know, we, we have a mountain here and we'll talk about this later. We'll have any mountain, any sacred place that's holy to, to your peoples, um, you pray to it, but, you know, some resource extractive industry can look at it and say, well, we just want to, 
take those resources and we say, no, it's sacred. It's just like your church, the metaphor, you know, Sistine Chapel, etc. That should be valid. That should be enough. What, what part of sacred don't you understand? Uh, and when it comes down to it, though, the issue is, is that none of that is permissible. The extraction, the process of allowing for desecration, where it's admitted through an administrative process through federal land management agencies and so forth, you can't even consider, even as a developer, to be able to desecrate a sacred site if you are aware, you're made aware, right, that it's a place that is special, it needs to be set aside and protected for the continuance of some of these cultural and spiritual religious existence and practices um, without thinking that somehow it's okay. And usually that means there's a factor of dehumanization where somebody has been rendered less than. And that way, the violation is expected. And it's acceptable. It becomes permissible in society and normalized. And that's a factor of appropriation and why it is extraordinarily dangerous because it can't happen without this factor of dehumanization. That's the first one of the first violations. And then it proceeds to, you know, a, a total violation that renders us culturally non existent. And that is cultural genocide. And that permits other forms of violence. You know, we could relate that and, you know, sort of extrapolate that out to missing men, indigenous women, girls, uh, trans, and two-spirit relatives. We can, you know, of course, apply that to the, the, the land-based desecrations and the pollution of our bodies. And, you know, it goes so, so, so far. So, um, you know, when we talk about appropriation, we're not just talking about an, an idea of representation through a Hollywood image or you know, some sports team's mascot, we have to look at the context of colonial violence and how that is directly connected to that uh, extraordinarily harmful and deadly legacy. Yeah, yeah. Your, your sound is, your mic is doing it again. It had done it before, but then it corrected itself. Now it's doing it again. Um, uh, uh, I'm sorry about that. Sorry we're having trouble with that, Clee and, and everyone. Um, I if you want to play the the, the, sh the little um, short, rough documentary, the, I yeah. can fix something. I'd love to. So let's, we'll introduce folks to um, a San Francisco Peaks issue. So everyone, uh, you know, hopefully you have a, a snack there. Let's, let's watch. It's about a 10 minute video. Um, and let me bring that up for us. Yeah, and, and if I may, can you hear me now? Uh, uh, it's still. Okay, yeah, it's, this is a rough cut of a documentary update that I'm making. I made a documentary back in 2004, 2005 called The Snowball Effect about the struggle to protect the San Francisco peaks. And I'll try to correct my sound and come back and hopefully explain more about that. Okay, great. Yes, this is a this is a rough cut, not a final cut. We're This is a premiere here. We're um, um, seeing it first here. So let's let me get this going. The San Francisco peaks have been held holy since time immemorial by Diné, Hopi, Zuni, Tewa, Wallapai, Havasupai, Yavapai Apache, Yavapai Prescott, Tonto Apache, White Mountain Apache, San Carlos Apache, San Juan Southern Paiute, Fort McDowell, Mojave Apache, and Acoma peoples. For decades, indigenous nations and environmental groups have resisted and filed multiple lawsuits to protect this extraordinary sacred site from ski area expansion and snowmaking with treated sewage. The Forest Service, which manages the peaks as public lands, has even acknowledged that there would be irreversible and irretrievable adverse impacts to the integrity of this sacred mountain and that snowmaking would contaminate the spiritual entirety of the San Francisco peaks. After more than a decade of court cases failed and numerous direct actions, Snowball clear cut new runs, built new lifts, and became the first ski area in the world to make fake snow from 100% treated sewage effluent on these sacred slopes. In 2002, Ignoring significant public opposition, the city of Flagstaff 
approved a contract to sell 180 million gallons of treated sewage per season to the ski area. Environmental groups have cautioned that the treated effluent is contaminated with pharmaceuticals, hormones, and antibacterial resistant genes, and that ecological impacts to plant, animal, and human life are largely unknown. Eight years ago, Arizona Snowball started making fake snow from treated sewage they purchase from the city of Flagstaff. This means to this day, up to nearly one and a half billion gallons of treated sewage has been sprayed on this holy site. In the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic that has ravaged disproportionately our indigenous communities, particularly the Diné or Navajo Nation, Snowball continues to violate our ability to heal by poisoning this endangered sacred place and our sacred medicines. The former president of the Navajo Nation, Joe Shirley Jr., called this violation an act of cultural genocide. How can our communities heal while the heart of our culture continues to be violated? Our human rights, our religious freedom is continually violated by this city that claims to support social justice and environmental integrity. Flagstaff politicians have sacrificed native culture for a racist business located outside city limits and for marginal economic gain. Snowball, the Forest Service, and the city of Flagstaff make a profit by killing indigenous cultures. We've been here, we've been working as hard as we can, praying as hard as we can for these other humans to understand that these mountains need to be left alone. of different species yeah. it is home to the lives of different species of the environment the trees the plants the flowers Woo. the healing plants there's lots to it Woo. and it also holds balance on this earth these sacred mountains in our way, in our traditional way, this is what holds the balance. And are we going to allow a few people to desecrate it? With absolutely zero input from Flagstaff community members, the city's contract with Snowball was administratively renewed in 2014 for 20 years. The voices of indigenous nations and the public were shut out of the process. The court battle to protect the peaks shaped harmful legal precedent for indigenous religious freedom and sacred sites throughout the so-called US. This has directly impacted indigenous sacred land struggles from Oak Flat to Standing Rock. In 2011, the United Nations recommended that the United States government engage in actions to ensure that they are in compliance with international standards in relation to the San Francisco peaks and other Native American sacred sites. Well, yeah, it is. If you're threatening to arrest me for accessing, yes, you will be arrested. So you're threatening to arrest me. If you come back to sign, you will be arrested. So you're telling me that I will be arrested. Yes. If I access my church here. I'm telling you, if you come back to sign without a pass, you will be arrested. Today. Arizona Snowball is preparing to further its assault against the holy San Francisco peaks. They have proposed a new master plan for expansion development that will introduce more wastewater snowmaking to this holy mountain. They are threatening to develop new facilities, new lifts, five new trails, night skiing, and a tubing facility. This ski business also wants to expand the desecration of this sacred mountain year-round 
with a mountain coaster, an alpine slide, zipline tours, mountain biking, expanded disc golf, a climbing wall, and outdoor concerts. This new expansion would not be possible without approval from the Forest Service and the wastewater contract that they maintain with the city of Flagstaff. For more than 40 years, community members, environmentalists, and indigenous peoples have worked together to protect this sacred mountain. We have protested, petitioned, litigated, marched, laid down before Snowball's destructive machinery. The suffering that this desecration is causing our peoples and non-human relations has been willfully ignored. fight to protect the peaks is not over. To stop fighting to protect this holy place means to give up and turn our backs on our culture and our future. We need your support more than ever to stop Snowball's assault on our cultural survival. The Forest Service, the courts, and Flagstaff City Council have all failed us. We have continually made the simple demand that the destruction of this sacred place stops so that our cultures may live and that we can heal. The Forest Service has the authority to end their special use permit. The city of Flagstaff has the authority to end their contract to sell wastewater to Snowball. <laughs> Indigenous politicians have the ability to force these political entities to negotiate and stop this desecration. We have pleaded with these politicians and government agencies to protect our sacred lands from acts of resource colonialism that kill our ways of life. They have only reminded us that there is no justice on stolen lands. Indigenous peoples throughout the world have been rising up in powerful ways to defend the sacred and take back ancestral lands. When the bulldozers start once again, when Snowball continues their assault on our ways of life by slowly destroying the sacred mountain, what will you do? We must not fail our ancestors in coming generations. There you are. Hi, Clee. Thank you for sharing that with us. How's your mic doing? Uh, well, you tell me. Oh, perfect. Beautiful. Well, it helped for now. So I'm on a different <laughs> connection. So hopefully that works. That's good. Um, thank you for sharing that that video with us. Um, uh, let's talk a, a, a little more about uh, uh, the sacred mountains. Um, and so when did this start when did this fight with um san francisco peak start it's back in the oh. 90s right oh, i would have to go back to first contact in colonialism uh, <laughs> we always but, uh, this <laughs> yes. phase of the fight um you know the uh, idea that settler colonizers just view this mountain as a resource to extract um some benefit from which in this case isn't gold, oil, coal, it's recreation as an extractive industry. Um, started in the 1930s and 
it was there was a low level ski area that was established before um the and there was no consultation with indigenous people of course no consent right, right. um and so uh that developed uh in the 1960s there was a proposal by a ski area corporation to develop a huge master plan development on the southwestern slopes of the mountain that in included Vail or Telluride style infrastructure with like shopping centers, mass hotels. And that was actually resisted. The uh, indigenous communities, environmentalists united and fought back and said that was an unacceptable use of the mountain. The, uh, as I mentioned in the video, the mountain is managed by the U.S. Forest Service's so-called public lands. And so um, the uh, there was a new proposal in the 1970s to make a smaller footprint ski area on 777 acres and that was approved by the forest service and uh regardless of all the testimony if you read the document i read the ei the eis the environmental impact statement from that time and uh there's very passionate uh, appeals stating that if this mountain is desecrated because of how central it is to our cosmology as indigenous people not just for one indigenous uh nation then it would create severe imbalance with our natural order and result in extreme disharmony for our ways of being. And so uh, the Forest Service outweighed that with economic interests and the you know, very short-term gain in recreational interests and basically asserted that it was um, a multiple-use mandate of over public lands that they couldn't just you know, reserve inside for uh, indigenous people and spirituality. So this case, so in 1974, um, the American Religious Freedom Act was passed. So that's the, the first time that indigenous people's spirituality was not outlawed, right? Like up until then, there were laws still in place that outlawed indigenous religious practices. Um, and uh, this was one of the first cases to test the uh, American Indian Religious Freedom Act. Uh, in the case known as Wilson versus Block. Um, and that ruling came out <clears throat> as an interpretation by the courts against the indigenous people who were advocating for protection of sacred lands and the environmental environmentalist, Dick and Jean Wilson. And uh, the, I, the interpretation of the court was is that over ERFA, and this is exposed as shortcoming in ERFA in the application of sacred places, is, is that it, the issue is about access, that um, since the... Um, the the re, the development of the ski area would not restrict native people from accessing the mountain they were violating our religious freedom and so the issue there is is that with that logic they could just chop off the whole top of the mountain as long as you have access to part of it you are not being restricted your religious practices so the application was very narrow and anti-indigenous um but it also is sort of like a backdoor idea right well here's a yeah. front door back door you know as long as you have access you can you know we're not causing problems so with that logic they can destroy a whole church and as long as there's part of it still there you're not being restricted for your religious freedom or by, it's not a violation and so it's a failure of arifa in terms of uh sacred places which we we witnessed if anybody studied these issues study lingui northwest if you haven't um, because that was the first case, and that case still is applicable. Um, that was with the Northwest Cemetery Association in, in a road that was being proposed to be developed through burial sites in Northern California, so-called California. Um, and uh, that road was never completed, but the law still stands, and Wilson versus Block still stands. And so there was a huge battle that really had nationwide implications regarding the precedent for indigenous religious freedom from the San Francisco peak struggle. So <clears throat> after that development in the 1990s, the Snowball Ski Area uh, proposed a new expansion plan. And that's when I got involved. I was still in high school, basically just wow. you know, right, right in high school. And so I got involved and um, I won't go into my long sad story, but um, uh, again, we shut them down effectively. We organized, we mobilized the community and we stopped them. And uh, they came back in the two, early 2000s, 2002, with a new proposal, 2001, 2002, with a new proposal, which was much more controversial because uh, we live in the desert southwest. Nobody thinks of skiing in Arizona, 
you think of the Grand Canyon and indigenous peoples, right? You think of the desert. Um, but this, because this mountain is so special, it's a sky island, it's a unique ecological uh, feature, the highest feature in Arizona, uh, we do get a lot of snow. And so, um, but it's intermittent and occasional. And in the face of climate change, uh, the future is dicey for any kind of ski operation. And so their proposal was to create a reliable product using the language of the ski area and make snow out of treated sewage effluent that they would purchase from the city of Flagstaff, as I mentioned. And then that's what happened. We fought them. Uh, and uh, so this documentary is incomplete because um, I want to interview folks like Jack Trope, who uh, amazing advocate, legal legal advocate, and a previous, uh, I think your predecessor, right? Right, right. Director mm -hmm. at the association there. So, I mean, so so we owe a strong, you know, not a debt of gratitude, but a strong sort of like, you know, uh, expression of our gratitude of mutuality and support because of the work that um, Jack Trope did there with the association and dedicated resources and representation for some of the indigenous nations when we were fighting in court. Um, and there's also another lawyer, Howard Shanker, who was representing the cases and, and they, they applied, they were the, this was the first case in 2000 and, um, after 2005, um, with Navajo Nation versus U.S. Forest Service et al., uh, filed complaints to stop this proposal as I, you know, talk a little bit about how the court cases failed. And so I want to interview them and talk about their application of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which now is something that's being used widely for other sacred sites, but it's used not necessarily wisely in application of protection for sacred places because we lost that court battle. And um, it was a, a sort of a, a shot in the dark because as it exists, we have a patchwork of laws that, you know, people try to apply in relation to protecting sacred places. And RIFRA hasn't had a good track record and we can speak to that. Um, so I want to do some interviews with them. And uh, there's a, a very important piece of news and information regarding the Autumn Anti-Border Collective who has been resisting desecration of their sacred springs in the so-called Mexico and US border. And last year there was some advocates, some powerful work that they did to shut down um, the desecration that was imposed by the Trump administration with the development of the border wall and protect their sacred sites uh, there. And uh, recently they used RIFRA, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, uh, not for the land defense, but actually, you know, um, uh, as a civil action, but actually as a, to, to address the criminal action um, that they were being charged with. And so they were successful in court. So this is a, a very important case to study um, with Amber Ortega down there with the Altamante Border Collective, because effectively, um, as it stands, uh, RIFRA applies to protect it, your religious expression in defense of sacred lands as, if you're, you know, acting to protect them as opposed to, you know, what we see RIFRA being applied to and fail regarding sacred sites. But, you know, this is all lawyer speak. I think y'all can speak probably uh, more eloquently to this than me. Yeah, well, it, it's, it's, it's really confusing. And, um, uh, and, you know, clearly there's federal policy um, and uh, statements from Congress, from the executive and from the judiciary that recognizes the importance of American Indian uh, sacred places, religion and cultural practices. You know, they all say that, you know, there, there's very strong statements of policy, but the, the framework in which they uh uh, they give us as a society to protect those places uh, seem to be um, uh, uh, not protected with equal vigor as other groups, um, religious and, and sacred places. Uh, I really liked, you know, you mentioned that in the final EIS that um, uh, there was a and if you don't mind, I'd love to read it. You mentioned how it talked about kind of forecasting. An elder was forecasting the damage to our world. If we, if you mess with the peaks, what's going to happen? And and I found the statement really powerful because I, 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 
I think it helps to place us in this time right now and how important and urgent it is for us to come together and, and work on protecting sacred places. Um, in one of your writings, it says, in the final EIS, Daniel Peaches, member of the Dene uh, Medicine Man's Association, stated, once the tranquility and serenity of the mountain is disturbed, the harmony that allows for life to exist is disrupted. The weather will misbehave. The ground will shift and tremble. The land will no longer be hospitable to life. The natural pattern of life will become erratic and the behaviors of animals and people will become unpredictable. Violence will become the norm and agitation will rule, so peace and peacefulness will no longer be possible. The plants will not produce berries and droughts will be so severe as to threaten all in existence. And um, uh, this was in the final environmental impact statement. Um, and and so this that's in the 70s. That's the actually 1979 impact statement. And that's not prophecy. That is just observation of the consequences of war against Mother Earth. Yeah. You know, across the board, we have medicine practitioners from all the different indigenous nations that hold this mountain who have all said the same thing, asserted the same thing. And my father, you know, this is part of the reason when you know people say, oh, you're, you're an activist or whatever. It's like, this is a sacred obligation that we have to ensure that we maintain harmony with our natural world and our cosmology. So we have to step up, stand up and fight back. Uh, so what, <laughs> what freaking tools do we have to do that, Glee? <laughs> what can this is we the do? exciting part of the conversation. Okay. <clears throat> uh, what, what, what do you all do there? What do you offer? I'm curious. Well, so we know that NARF this week, I think it, uh, NARF announced a new uh, Sacred Places initiative where they were, um, it, it seemed uh, to build uh, templates and other tool kits to help uh, practitioners um, who are trying to protect sacred places to understand the current law and what have you. Um, so that's some good work happening there um, uh, from NARF. Uh, the work that, that we, the association has done in the past, uh, besides uh, litigation efforts and legal and, and policy shifts, uh, you know, we've worked with folks on the ground, like at Medicine Wheel in, in Wyoming, to help uh, protect that, that site, uh, to get it recognized as a national, uh, on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, of course, from what we understand about the site now is that it's still in vital need of, of protection and, and cleanup and support. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's something the, the association is working on um, and will be working on with uh, the tribes that are connected to that site uh, to talk to them about what they want to happen there. How can we best protect this place? Um, what is it that needs to happen and what, what can we move towards? Um, you know, so quite often we're looking at, the association is looking at, at, at sacred places uh, really reactively. Uh, we don't have a strong proactive strategy on what we need to be doing to shift uh, perspective and change the way we all look and uh, respond to these things that happen. Um, we react. Um, we hear about line three or line five. We do our best to support those people on the ground that, that are working to protect um, uh, their sacred places. Same with Standing Rock. Um, so, you know, this is a time right now in the association's history, we're 100 years old, um, we're rebuilding our capacity um, and really want to be on the ground um, doing good work instead of in governmental buildings. Um, you know, so I, I'm really asking you because um, uh, we're looking for help 
on, you know, what is the best strategy now in the world we live in, knowing that the law has been ineffective? You know, what can we do to change hearts and minds now? Oh, your freaking sound is freaking out again. You're trying to get in. I must have talked too long. I got pissed off. Yeah, let me see if there's a different connection issue that I might be facing because I've treated the internet. Hello now. Uh, it's the same. It's funny. Once you start talking for a while, it'll go away after about three or four minutes. So yeah, it's it's still there. I can I can still understand what you're saying. And I really want to know how to fix this. <laughs> Uh, Colleen, I'm going to bring up what, what Colleen uh, just how about, said. How about this? In the chat. Does, that, does that change anything? Yes, it did. It, it works now. Um, I okay. just brought up what Colleen said in the chat, and she said, we believe in prayer. We listen to the elders, traditional practitioners, and our knowledge keepers, too. So then that's, Col that was going to be my first response. Um, our cultures are our first frameworks for action. And so everything flows from there. Uh, because if I had the answers to what we can do to intervene, to address these issues and bring justice and healing for our lands and the relations, um, we wouldn't be in the situation we are out with the Holy San Francisco Peaks, for example, right? Where they're proposing a new master plan development and for trying to further their desecration. So it's been a challenge for us to own our failures, to be honest with them, but also look at ways to be more effective and look at all of the avenues that we have. So we can look at the political avenues and we can see how they are designed to fail us. Um, so it's very limited. You know, folks are talking about lobbying um, and there, there are groups and we can look at the Native American Rights Fund's currently current strategy with Susan Schoenharjo, who's been a powerful, immense advocate. She actually helped to, you know, she's one of the architects, architects of ERFA, um, who's leading that charge. Um, you know, but they have a three-year time frame, from what I understand, for assessing and exploring uh, policy actions. And, you know, this is an issue that I, you know, I, I don't put my energy into the policy components because of how the system institutionally has embedded its anti-indigenous understandings that are connected to how to sustain and build and grow its, you know, uh, existence through resource extraction and destruction. As long as we have a society of people that believe that the earth can be commodified and just used and exploited for their gain, to sustain their ways of being, we're gonna always have this conflict. That's part of the problem. Wherever there's an environmental crisis, there's a, a social or cultural crisis because we're people of the earth. And so part of it is a fundamental you know, contradiction regarding uh, intention regarding values, but it's not just a value shift that we need. Um, so for me, we start with prayer and ceremony. We understand that. And then we build and we bring people into the circle of mutuality because when we talk about, you know, healing, when we talk about what values we have. We have to have that shared understanding to, to build from, you know, that's what some people call respect. You know, that's why we, we assert what part of sacred don't you understand? So if we can bring people into that understanding to shift our ways of being in relationship to the harm that currently this dominant social order is rooted in, whether it's what we call it capitalism, um, whether we call it colonialism, like settler colonialism and resource colonialism is the two primary components of that, or white supremacy or heter cis heteropatriarchy. Um, you know, these are core oppressive pillars that uphold this society that we have to contend with to get to that point. And so part of it to me is a fight. It's assertion. It's about direct action and intervention. But intervention is hard to sustain. So if we look at the political solutions, we only have very few options. There are administrative processes through NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, 
we reference all these environmental impact statements, studies, assessments. We've been studied to death. We've been consulted to death uh, with processes. What more consultation could occur until we realize that there is no negotiation. It's just a formality of documentation that harm eventually will be done. And whatever mitigation measures are pretty much um, non-existent and the harm will be inevitable. So if you study the NEPA process, there are very few cases. Like we can look at Wind Cave, I think, um, in uh, near Lake Tahoe, I believe it is, um, Nevada, California, uh, where a public land management agency decided to work with the indigenous people and protect the sacred site from recreational activities. Um, but that was at the, um, you know, basically the discretion of the public land management agency there. And then it went up the chain of command and that decision was rendered, you know, and reinforced, uh, even though, uh, you know, a, a strong lobby from recreations who wanted to desecrate the site. We can also look at, um, uh, you know, some of the other sites um, uh, in very limited, you know, places where the political advocacy has worked. And we can look at the patchwork of laws. We can look at ERFA. We can look at RIFRA. We can look at the uh, Executive Order 13007 that was signed by Clinton in 1996, I believe. Um, you know, there's a handful of tiny little laws that, you know, policy-wise could apply to sacred lands. And we look at the current cases, uh, if we look at the political framework and um, the legal options that we have as well, uh, because inevitably if a decision goes against us, you know, litigation is expected or some kind of appeal uh, and it's always planned for and not, you know, these campaigns that are developed because nothing usually goes our way. Um, then we can look at Standing Rock, Lake Oahe is a sacred site struggle at its core with, you know, I, I think it was Earth Justice, um, one of the, the lead um, uh, legal advocates behind that. And, um, you know, we look at uh, many of the other cases, uh, Oak Flat, you know, contemporary uh, sacred site battle currently in court, right? Um, pending appeals. Um, they're using RIFRA as well. And uh, RIFRA, if, if, I mean, I, we could explain it a little bit, but I'll try to do my best to make it short. Um, it just has a, a, a two or three component test, which uh, one, the federal government has to establish that they have a compelling interest to uh, do a development if it violates, you know, some religious practice. Uh, the other component on, from the other side is, is that there has to be a, a proven substantial burden placed upon the practitioners, the people who have a grievance regarding violations of sacred places. Um, and with that, uh, that test is interpreted by the justices, the courts. And in our case, with the Navajo Nation versus U.S. Forest Service, the uh, Ninth Circuit on uh, banc court, so the full Ninth Circuit, ruled that and in, the, in their decision if you I, I highly recommend anybody who studies sacred sites to read that decision because it's so anti-indigenous and it shows how the history all the way back to the Marshall trilogies if you're students of laws I'm not a lawyer I never went to university I barely I didn't even really graduate high school but I forced myself to study these things because my dad was like hey you need to understand what weapons are using against you and um so uh if you study that court case um they explicitly state that the only um, the only offense would be emotionally subjective religious to our to indigenous people's emotionally subjective religious experience. So understand that language coming from a court interpreting whether or not our deeply held spiritual relationship, our religious practices to a site is legitimate or not. Emotionally subjective spiritual experience, religious experience. That's it. Uh, that would not apply, I'm certain, to... Uh, oh, actually, it didn't apply to Hobby Lobby because Hobby Lobby effectively used RIFRA and uh, turned their craft store into a church because they didn't want to distribute birth control to their workers. So Hobby Lobby can be protected, but a, a site that's holy to 13 indigenous nations, that's central, it's one of our pillars for our cosmology can't be. So this is what we're contending with if we're talking about policy and uh, litigation. Uh, the other component is, um, you know, we have local level campaigns, uh, administrative process, but again, you know, interpretation, it's uh, all about discretion because of the Patrick laws. And the other option is economic, right? So it, in Standing Rock, they uh, tried to apply a divestment, you know, strategy or boycott strategies. 
right. um, in many um, uh, places where we see large NGOs or nonprofit organizations apply that um, uh, strategy of um, economic um, sanction, if you will. Um, but it's very limited and there's no guarantees. And it's basically fighting capitalism with capitalism, which is, is a, um, if you don't have enough resources, you're going to lose. Um, and so some sacred places, people have considered strategies of buyouts, like buying the developments, but it's a very dicey situation that was actually considered here with the Holy San Francisco peaks. And it was um, shot down by the spiritual practitioners we consulted with regarding that because they didn't want to reward developers for holding hostage sacred, sacred lands. So because if you do that for one developer, what prevents them from going to other sacred places, snatching them up for some low price and then holding them hostage and demanding millions and millions of dollars, which they tried to do with the San Francisco peaks. They wanted to sell mm -hmm. the mountain for $19 million or the, 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 actually sell the ski area infrastructure because they can't sell the permit. It's a special use permit that the Forest Service just gives them. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that was what we were contending with at the time, even though they had bought the ski area in like the mid 1990s for like $4 million, which is less than the price of one lift at Vail. Um, so yeah, they tried to hold us economic hostage and um, it's not a viable strategy because it can't apply to everybody. And then we have this other strategy, which is a very unique and interesting strategy that is being applied to bear's ears, right? With co-management. Um, right. And that's sort of an administrative process. But the, the, the limitations with bear's ears is that um, it's not applicable to other sacred lands. I think it's starting to be to some degree. There's a model that is being proven to work, um, but it's not a fix that goes across the board. It doesn't apply to the San Francisco Peaks, for example. It doesn't apply to Red Butte, which is the sacred site just you know, miles from the south rim of the Grand Canyon that right now um, uh, energy fuels resources, uh, Canadian um, uh, uranium mining company is trying to open up Pinion Plain uranium mine, like just miles from the south rim of the Grand Canyon, right at the base of this sacred site, which is the emergence point for, or, or one of the more, more uh, most sacred holy places for Havasupai. So, you know, this is what we're facing right now. Um, Co-management won't work if you have a hostile entity that's managing those public lands. Um, so there has to be some sense of cooperation or force, you know, uh, or, or compulsion. And, um, you know, we've tried direct action. You saw in the video, I've been arrested many times. I faced federal charges, uh, you know, sitting there in a federal holding cell with my feet shackled and my uh, um, shackles around my wrist, uh, handcuffed to my waist. And I went before a judge and um, it was uh, two weeks before uh, Snowball was getting ready to make snow the first time. And the, the, the prosecutor, the federal prosecutor came in and he said, uh, um, we need to make sure that he's banned from all public lands, the Forest Service. So that way, you know, he doesn't cause trouble up at Snowball. So they tried to prevent me from going any of the National Forest Service, <laughs> Coquino National Forest Service, what it's called here. And so uh, I told my lawyer, I said, that's a violation of religious freedom. So let him know. Yeah. And so that's what he said. And the judge looked at me and he said, if this is an act of subterfuge, then you're going to pay the price. And that means if you have any violations of your release conditions, then we're going to mandatorily um, lock you up in a federal holding cell until your next court appointment. So that's how dangerous native people are who want to practice their religious freedom and defend sacred right. places. You right. end up in chains and you end up banned, <laughs> but to facing a ban or facing imprisonment um, while they get to, excuse my language, shit on your your sacred holy site. Yeah, literally, literally. So, uh, so direct action is limited. In, unless you, I, I, I used to say, unless you're, you're, you're Mohawk, you know, or um, from uh, <laughs> Then uh, direct action is not is is, is hard to sustain. Um, have a bunch of tires and it can, um, it can be very effective. But we can look at Standing Rock. Standing Rock was a powerful success on one level in terms of its social and cultural movement and activation for right. a generation of young folks and the fulfillment of work from forty years of advocacy or fifty years of advocacy and the culmination that was powerful. But did it stop the pipeline from being developed? We have to be real about that question. Look at the strategy, own that as a failure on, a, a, on that practical term, assess it and see what we can do more effectively to protect sacred places. 
because this this is um when we talk about cultural genocide and cultural Are, am I am I disconnected? No, you're, oh, can you you're hear me? still there. You froze for a second. So just yeah, for okay, a second. okay. Oh, this okay. is what, what. Well, I was basically just illustrating what the stakes are, um, if we don't take this seriously. And this is a critical issue because the the point that it come always comes to for me is something that one of um, uh, the, uh, the Hopi practitioners, he's a spiritual runner named Bucky Preston, said, is is that global warming is a consequence of the war against Mother Earth. Um, and to me, when we look at global warming, it, it really is one of the greatest crises if we recognize it as facing humanity. And it is just that it was a result of this war against mother earth. And if we don't understand it on those terms and we don't engage and shift our strategies, then we're going to constantly be going through this motion of trying to reform a system that was not designed to benefit or us or in our interests. You know, part of this is, is, is a conflict. Uh, a huge conflict, not just of values, not just of recognition, but a practical conflict that is destroying Mother Earth. So intervention is essential. It's necessary. Application of direct action and many means, not just any means, <laughs> many means that start with our cultures and ceremony as our framework for action. Then we build and we find ways to engage and use a diversity of tactics. How is how are the tactics um, with working uh, with non-native organizations and entities, conservation groups, environmental groups, and 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 that lot? What what has your experience been with with that uh, those efforts? Uh, complicated, <laughs> antagonistic, uh, sometimes rewarding, uh, but always skeptical. And the reason for that is because, you know, and in, in I, I helped to, with Indigenous Action, we published a piece and I helped to write it with a, a range of collaborators called Accomplices Not Allies in 2014. And that zine, we basically assert that, you know, there's this ally industrial complex. There's, you know, folks who just show up and they're self-appointed. And a lot of people just, you know, want to be white saviors uh, or they're motivated by senses of white guilt or, you know, like they look at this colonial legacy they understand, you know, the implications of it and they want to, you know, be do, do gooders, you know, and, and that's great. But there are also elements of that of, you know, victimization, you know, sort of, sort of like perpetuating victimhood and not fully recognizing this, you know, idea of agency or, you know, autonomy with indigenous people. Um, and I face that, you know, especially with the nonprofit industrial complex. I'm a huge critic of the nonprofit industry. I'm one, I'm an anti-capitalist. So inherently that makes me a critic of the nonprofit industry because it is rooted in capitalism. Um, and it was designed to suppress movements, control them. Uh, so it's really a very limited uh, uh, sort of sector, if you will. Um, but uh, I've had so many experiences where whether it's environmental big environmental justice groups saying that we're not going to win this issue if we're looking at strategy we're not going to win this issue x x y and z and i've worked on a range of campaigns as you mentioned before um, on cultural issues we have to win it on environmental issues because that's what people care about um and i my response usually is like well if we don't win on our terms we've already lost if we don't engage on our terms um we've negotiated away that which makes us who we are we've already sacrificed our existence so that embedded kind of like institutional racism exists within these nonprofit or NGO groups very deeply. It's it's shifted more recently. I would say Standing Rock sort of opened up the dialogue to some degree, but a lot of those NGOs like 350.org were still driving the strategy at Standing Rock. If you look at it, it's a climate justice, just transition strategy that was ultimately sort of superimposed on, you know, a few in indigenous NGOs and they sort of just were in the back seat or the, you know, the driver's seat, uh, you know, with the backseat driver, for, you know, Bill McKibben there uh, directing folks. And I think that we need to develop our own strategy. We need to have our, you know, our own consultations to see what ways we can be effective. And I think that that's the power of the land back movement to some degree, but it's hard to call it a, a movement when, you know, we see these same sort of pieces of, you know, policy work and things that are just being, you know, picked and choosed and superimposed 
um, and, and not a deeper sort of thinking that's going into that, an assertion to me of what should be an assertion of indigenous autonomy and mutuality to bring our relatives back into existence, to heal our ways of being and assert that, um, you know, so whether it means seizing, you know, our sacred lands and protecting them, which is going to be a hard thing to do if you're feeling, facing military or paramilitary forces, <laughs> whether it's in Morton County, whether it's on the San Francisco peaks or, you know, Oak Flat, um, that's a daunting task if we don't have that support. So, you know, there's, there is the, a disconnect between the strategies that I think could work if there is actually meaningful dialogue and meaningful interest from nonprofit organizations or these other, you know, large NGOs or EJ, environmental justice, social justice groups to, to sit down and actually have these tough questions, talk about col colonialism, talk about resource colonialism, settler colonialism, and talk about indigenous liberation, what we mean by that, um, you know, because we can't talk about sacred sites uh, without those very deep conversations. Yeah. And it's so hard. Um, I've found, and I guess I, I, I guess I didn't expect it, you know, as a practicing attorney, um, uh, when I went into law because I wanted to be able to, um, uh, use the law, uh, to prevent this shit from happening. Um, and what I found, um, disappointingly, is a lot of people just waiting for a paycheck. <laughs> um, attorneys, you know, uh, creating controversy to up their fees. And attorneys, you know, picking their token Indians in their law firms um, to create this sense of, of community and, and responsibility to the issues that are important to us. When really it's all been it's all been about making money and kind of keeping the status quo, and and um, when I moved into to nonprofit work, I expected to for some reason to see this kind of harmonious <laughs> um, uh, uh, unity because we're in a nonprofit. We're not here to make money. We're here to do um, uh, good work and to support one another. And again, what I see, and I don't know if it's particular to Indian country um, or if it's just part of uh, being a human being, um, but everyone seems to have their little turf. And it's really difficult to come together and have honest conversations about who has the best skills to do what. You know, like the old days, traditionally, um, you know, in our culture, the women would stand behind the men because we told them where to go and, and they were the speakers and, and we were uh, the guide for them, right? Um, you know, there are um, opportunities when we all can come together and have transparent conversations and, you know, split up the work and um, uh, agree to... Um, uh, go at it with all of our might instead of, you know, um, hoping to get this big grant from this place or that place that's going to feed some kind of new idea or new way of looking at something. There's just not that. Um, it's really hard to explain unless you're in the middle of it, but I found it difficulty really to build uh, collaboration uh, to do good. And so quite often uh, the association with our staff um, uh, who, who's here with us tonight, uh, Colleen Medicine and, and Kim Smith uh, and uh, Shauna Shackleton, who you might have seen on our um, in the chat. Uh, you know, it's us and people like you that we work with to try to really um, push the needle in a certain direction. It, it, it's not easy. I don't know, Clee, uh, have you, um, how do we create more collaboration and unity among ourselves? Uh, well, I'm probably not the best person to talk about <laughs> oh, unity. come on. <laughs> and and I'll, I'll explain why. But first, I mean, my, like the question to me, for me is how do we break that model down then if this mm -hmm. isn't working for us? Because it's an mm -hmm. institutional model that was designed you know, in the context of capitalism to solve 
problems <laughs> through you know capitalism and I, I think we need, actually need to challenge that radically um and that should be an institutional uh task um because nonprofits are extraordinarily limited when it comes down to it on that level and people's motivations you know are you know if there's a paycheck there there's going to be people who are motivated for that paycheck that's why our discipline with the struggle to protect the San Francisco peaks from the beginning of our organ was no nobody gets paid this is mm -hmm. a you know it's not just about volunteerism it's like understanding what our responsibilities are and making that that small sacrifice that we can and sometimes it's a big sacrifice believe me um uh trying to scramble for lawyers and all that you know and ask people for whatever we can or caravan out you know to we took a hundred over a hundred people from our communities here to a caravan to the ninth circuit court and occupied Ohlone lands in so-called san francisco when we were going to court and we housed everybody, we fed everybody. We used, you know, like in, in, we did the same thing in Pasadena and we used food, not bombs to feed like, you know, the Hopi tribal politicians and the, uh, the spiritual elder practitioners who don't get along with them. You know, it was amazing, you know, community creativity and our, you know, basically resourcefulness. You know, I grew up with very little resources uh, and so i learned i was disciplined early on to use what we can responsibly and i think that 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 there's a disconnect between going to a massive organization that already has a built-in network of funders and the funders are a really key component philanthropy is very um control is a huge control aspect to how things get done, what gets moved, and what gets priority in terms of nonprofit industries. If a foundation thinks that your work is not interesting or not the w direction they want, they'll move that money and you ha have to rethink your approach to your grant. So you're beholden to that. So it's easy to see how people get caught in that trap, uh, you know, professionally and becomes a career. But I, I've talked to people. I've, I've really had people just look at me straight in the face saying that they wouldn't show up at a demonstration if they weren't getting paid. And I, I can't understand that. I can't reconcile that. I, I don't, I didn't, you know, and I still don't. I, I think it's unacceptable and it should be challenged and we should break those frameworks. We should look at different ways to sit down together because, you know, I'm not interested in a seat at the table. I'm interested in flipping that table and making sure that whatever we can do is effective towards, you know, uh, protecting, restoring, to um, ensure that we have a healthy future in harmony for existence. And, you know, if we call that liberation, if that means the abolition of the carceral state, you know, if it means uh, abolition of capitalism and colonialism, that's what we have to work towards. And we have to find effective ways to do it while we're surviving at the same time, which is a big challenge. So people, you know, if they're getting a paycheck at a nonprofit and it works for them, that's great. But if you know, we're looking at multi-million dollar resources coming and going. I mean, we we put our struggle with the San Francisco Peaks on, I mean, we could probably count that in the tens of thousands of dollars or less for everything that we did. We were extraordinarily resourceful and we were disciplined with it. And, and I'm, I'm personally very proud of that. I don't say that very often, um, but that is in contrast to some of these nonprofits that are throwing millions of dollars. Like I, I have, I mean, I can go off with my grievances of the nonprofit industry, but one time we were hosting uh, the longest walk too. Uh, we hosted Den Dennis uh, Banks the time he came through and his crew back in 2008. I think it was the, um, the big anniversary of the, the original long walk from 1978. And um, uh, I had a nonprofit group um, who just wanted to throw money at a caterer uh, to feed all the walkers. There was about 125 or more of them who are walking through. And I said, our, our, we have people in the community who are excited. They want, they, they cook, they feed, they want to donate everything that they have. And that's their connection. That's what they can offer. They can't walk. They can't go along with them on this journey. So that's their part that they want to play in this powerful movement. And we can't deny them that. We shouldn't deny them that. Because if we just throw money at something and just feed people, there's no connection. That's not how we are. And I think if we can come back to those teachings and understandings and actually have these discussions around a fire, you know, we have different cultural contexts and ways of being, right? What works for your community, your people, your culture. Let's talk about what those are 
let's start with those conversations. And we can look at what's happening at Winnemucca with the resistance to Thacker Pass and uh, the lithium mining. We can look at Wallapai right now, the resistance to lithium mining that's happening there too. With this, you know, The green economy right now is being railroaded through indigenous lands right. and we're suffering you know, at a, at, a, at a great price for what people say is climate justice. So if we want to talk about the tensions between environmental justice groups <laughs> and their agendas and what we're going to have to come to terms with regarding capitalism, if we want to sustain unsustainable ways of life, we have to look at this new wave of resource colonialism that is being greenwashed. And uh, if you look at the history of Dinepike or the Navajo Nation, and actually I have a map, maybe we could pull that up. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll speak to that, but that'll punctuate and contextualize the geopolitical relationship that the system has with our people. So to me, this is what we have to really come to terms with this. Let's, let's, let's restore that, reconnect. Oh uh, yeah. So this, this is, this is actually a very um, preliminary map. It's based on a map that I designed uh, some years ago to contextualize uh, resource colonialism in Dinepikea. So that's a map, um, the brown part. So this is not finished, everybody. Sorry, this is just a, you're getting a sneak peek. Um, I'm working on it right now. But if you can see it, um, that's a map of Dinepikea, the reservation lines. But you can see the sacred mountains that we have, um, the six holy mountains. Uh, you can see Flagstaff, so-called Flagstaff and um, the Kohosli there on the lower left-hand side. Um, but uh, I, I wanted to show this in an animated form for this presentation, but we can't. Um, but if you go down the top of the list, you can look at the coal-fired power plants. Um, there are uh, one, two, three, four, five active coal-fired power plants in or around Navajo Nation. Two of them, the San Juan Generating Station and the Four Corners Plant, right now have a uh, one of the largest, uh, or uh, a methane plume hovering over it that was detected detected by NASA scientists about a decade ago that is the size of Delaware right now. Um, so we look at hot spots regarding climate injustices. Um, and uh, so down the list, there's coal mines. There's actually uh, two coal mines and one power plant that was shuttered very recently through powerful work uh, that environmental advocates were doing. But it's also you know, not a full victory that they can own because um, if you look at the trajectory of coal, coal has been phased out and natural gas is actually what is being, uh, p what's powering a lot of this uh, U.S. settler colony right now. Um, and so the coal mines actually were just already, the, the businesses, they did wanted to get out of them because of the liability, the cleanup and all that. Navajo Nation, our, our puppet tribal governments actually tried to buy the um, uh, Navajo Generating Station, the one that's X'd out there in Page, um, and that helped to shut down the two mines that were actually you know, polluting our lands where my family's from up in Black Mesa. And so those are X'd out. And then uh, we go down and we look at the fracking oil drilling wells and methane. And um, you see all that yellow that's just scattered. Um, mm -hmm. Those are all, those, there's hundreds of thousands of fracking wells and oil derricks in this, what's called the San Juan Basin. And that is all right now um uh yeah desecrating our land so you know part of the air quality the pollution you know when people look at you know and ask you know why is there such a disparity and why you know at the beginning of the pandemic did the navajo nation face the highest rates of covid infections even be above new york you know we have to look at the environmental factors we look at the asthma look at the health issues and diseases that are caused because of the exposure of, you know, environmental contaminants and pollution. Um, and so we go down that list uh, and we can see the oil refineries, oil pipelines, um, which I'm still, you know, that's a really rudimentary um, part of the map. Uh, we can look at the uh, uranium mills, all these old mill sites. Those, those mills are closed, but I didn't X them out because they are still polluting. <laughs> They're still seeping. Uh, the, the mill close to Shiprock um, up there in uh, um, the sort of north part of that map, that mill is seeping uh, uh, waste, nuclear or uh, radioactive waste into the San Juan River every pretty much every day. Um, so it's not necessarily X'd out. The uh, rare metals um, uh, old mill site by processing site near Tuba City, that one's, um, it's covered up with asphalt. 
but it still leaches out into the uh, Monkopi wash um, and so forth. And then we look at the red dots. We look down at the red dots. Those are all abandoned uranium mines. There's a documented 523 abandoned uranium mines just on Dinepike or the Navajo Nation, but there are 2,000 throughout the surrounding area. And um, the last time, because I, I also work with a group called Clean Up the Mines and another group called Hall No. Clean Up the Mines has been advocating for um, a, accountability to clean up the legacy of all these abandoned uranium mines, not just on Dinepikea, but there's 10,000 abandoned uranium mines located throughout the so-called U.S. Um, in, in South Dakota, for example, many people don't know this. There's over 170, I think. Some of them, like 19 of them, I believe. I can't remember the exact numbers in close proximity to the sacred Black Hills. And so, you know, there's 10,000 abandoned uranium mines, 90, uh, close to 90% of them are located on so-called public and tribal lands. <laughs> so we look at this map, we see one picture of a, a huge issue that we continue to face. And in my advocacy, through meeting with the EPA, I ask them how many mines have actually been cleaned up to a standard that you can say is, is clean and not causing further environmental and community harm. And they said zero. So that, that's to this day, even though we've had the Navajo Nation five-year cleanup plan that was implemented by Hen, uh, Congressman Henry Waxman many years ago. And that that actually, that action was stimulated because of a documentary called Return to Navajo Boy. Um, but we look at the Church Rock spill, the single largest nu nuclear accident in U.S. history happened in the 1970s with the Church Rock spill. And hardly anybody know about it, knows about it. It took three months for the governor of New Mexico to declare a, a national or, or a, a state emergency um, because, you know, I mean, did they think about Native people living there and the, the harmful legacy? They're working to clean up abandoned uranium mines there right now, but the, even the Navajo Nation doesn't know what they're going to do because part of the proposal is to move some of those waste um, from, from those sites, from those mines they're going to clean up and put them at the White Mesa Mill, which is actually um, hundreds of miles away on um, uh, Ute lands. And that mill is desecrating their sacred lands and polluting their communities. So they want to transport that waste up through our, our communities, <laughs> the roadways where they could, you know, face accidents. And uh, that's their idea for cleanup. So this is, this is where we're at right now. And that's not cleanup. That's just moving the mess and the problem and going to process it and actually basically mining the waste from these mines to use for further nuclear fuel for this illusion of green economy. So pe when people talk about nuclear power as a solution to the climate uh, emergency that we're facing, mm -hmm. they forget about the whole nuclear fuel cycle. The fact that one, you have to mine it from the ground and what happens then. And if you look at the Navajo Nation, the fact that this is, I mean, we're talking in the 1940s, these mines started millions of, of uh, tons of, um, nuclear or uh, radioactive ore move uh, from our communities, some used for weapons, some used for energy. And none of these have been cleaned up to this day. <laughs> so you want to start start talking about new nuclear energy, more nuclear energy. And they don't, if you look at the end of the nuclear chain, uh, they don't have a place to store the waste from the current nuclear power plants that they have in operation. They want to store it in Yucca Mountain, a sacred site for Western Shoshone people at, you know, just right close to um, the Nevada test site, which is basically renders the Western Shoshone the most bomb nation on earth with more than a thousand above ground and underground nuclear detonations that were tested there at the test site. So they want to move the waste there into the sacred mountain called Yucca Mountain. I mean, this is not a, as a as national repository through trains and in and, and trucks and other systems. Nuclear energy is a deadly lie when it comes down to solutions for climate justice. But a lot of these n larger NGOs, you know, are pushing for that. They're vying for that because, you know, they, they see it as this sort of green, cleaner option than coal or natural gas, you know, which is completely unacceptable because obviously we have our experience that is still ongoing. I mean, I have, I've been to some of these mines in, in Cameron. There's over a hundred uh, abandoned uranium mines in that area. And one that I've, I've gone to document frequently um, a mitigation measure was just to fence it in and cover it up with 10 inches of topsoil. And there's nothing protecting the groundwater there. And um, some of the families that live in that area, I mean, literally, you can see the houses just barely down the road, less than a quarter of a mile from this abandoned uranium mine. You know, that's that's the reality that we live with. 
so we can't talk about new nuclear. <laughs> yeah. uh, and so, um, and the last thing, the last thing on the key of the map, sorry, if you get me into no. charts. No, that's charts, okay. Nuclear, <laughs> that's colonialism. nuclear colonialism is its own category. For those of you who haven't heard of the term, it's important to recognize that, um, you know, this is a severe issue that's ongoing right now. And in, in terms, we should, we should include our, our, our concerns regarding nuclear power with um, rare earth mining and lithium mining as well, because of the reality of this so-called green economy push that really is putting pressure on indigenous sacred lands. And that ties into resolution copper, right? With Oak flat too, because they want to use all that copper for um, solar panels and wind farms and so forth. That's part, part of what the, the propaganda from this, you know, resolution copper has been Rio Tinto. Um, yeah. And the, the last thing on this list is the grocery stores. Um, and I put that there because of, you know, this during the pandemic, there was a lot of attention given to uh, Dinepike or the Navajo Nation um, regarding the concerns of the impacts of COVID-19 and the disproportionate rate. And people were looking at, you know, the fact that Navajo Nation is a food desert, which, you know, there's no such thing as a food desert for our people before colonization. Um, <laughs> systematically, our means of sufficiency or self, you know, autonomy, I should say, I don't even call it self-sufficiency, autonomy in relationship to where we get our food from, right, um, was attacked, you know, by Kit Carson, of course, Scorch, Scorch Earth campaigns, which, you know, led up to the long walk in 1864 in our internment um, and dis total disruption of our traditional diet um, uh, to the point where now what we have nine grocery stores that I count. And I, in some people, when they, when they, um, I, I, I put this together recently with my research, when they count grocery stores in the Navajo Nation, they count small grocers, like a trading post that just happen to have groceries there amidst like piles of soda, you know, cans and, um, uh, junk foods. And, uh, also, uh, they count d dollar stores and, um, uh, gas stations. So yeah. I only counted actual large grocery stores that have, you know, shelves of or, or rows of produce. And so there's only nine on the Navajo Nation. So it constitutes a food desert because if the population area here is over 250,000, close to 300,000, a size, uh, the, an area the size of West Virginia, I guess the state of so-called West Virginia. Um, and so, yeah, so, but that's a factor, right? Uh, regarding the disruption of our ways of being to the point where now we're reliant on what still amount to a colonial diet and colonial relationship or capitalist relationships has been supplanted uh, over uh, uh, our you know ways of being. And, and, and every year, like my, my dad recently took all his cows from Black Mesa because um, the conflicts that face there and the pressure from the land management agencies that are just trying to say that we're overgrazing. So we're, there, there's overgrazing in the, the, the grasses and the fields are drying up the feed for our animals because the coal mining companies drain so much of our water <laughs> because uh, the desertification, if you will, regarding climate injustice issues that were caused by the burning of that coal. You know, you want to talk about, you know, you want to, you know, point the finger at us, our traditional management systems of, with the land. It's like we pay attention to land. We listen to land. We figure out what the traumas are. How can we work with that? How can we heal it? How can we make sure we can restore it and let that land rest and then bring it back? So there's some powerful movements right now. People, you know, establishing small water catchments and looking at, you know, recontouring the land and, you know, doing what they can. Um, you know, the the resistance. The I, I wrote an article about this um, about the the indigenous resistance and COVID nineteen and resource colonialism. Uh, it's uh, it's posted on indigenousaction.org, but I sort of contextualize this and I put it in perspective regarding, you know, everything from food deserts to the pollution that we face and, and the ongoing uh, destruction of our lands is just sort of one snapshot of, you know, what we continue to face in terms of resource extractive industries. And if we're talking about climate change, we have to look at this. Um, but the really, the, the point is, is that there are powerful forms of resistance, of mutuality, where people have responded to this COVID-19 pandemic and said, yes, we need to grow our food. We can't rely and be dependent upon these outside corporations. The Navajo Nation thinks that part of the solution is just to build Walmarts, you know, in every corner of our res and Home Depots and all these corporations. I don't think that's the solution. 
I think that's part of the problem because it creates and facilitates more dependency on these corporations. What about our ways can we connect to, to restore, to ensure that we have harmony so we don't continue to face these crisis after crisis? Because the COVID-19 is a, is, is a compounded crisis. It is a crisis that we can't ignore the fact that capitalism and colonialism have a huge part in precipitating and our ways of mutual aid or if you call it eh, as Diné people or whatever your languages are of bringing people back into understanding that nothing you know everything for everybody nothing for ourselves not just that mentality but also that we we, we need to work together to support each other not just to survive but to 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 thrive and to 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 be uh who we are and fulfill that in existence in health and harmony. There's a lot of work to be done, but it's a powerful amount of work that people are doing right now to intervene in the front lines in, in, in shutting down um, resource colonialism, extractive industries. They're applying themselves to restore our natural traditional food ways, uh, applying themselves in so many ways, even just, just radical, radically redistributing resources, making sure things are accessible, um, that kind of work is so powerful and, and so necessary. And there's some great groups um, out there doing this effort, leading these eff efforts. Yes, there are. Ooh, well, we kept you way over time um, <laughs> this evening, but I've, I'm have i enjoying all of it, Clee, and I have uh, 10 other questions I could get into right now, but I want to be mindful of of you and, and your well-being and the time that you've given all of us and sharing um, uh, what's going on um, in your homelands and um, where we can go to get more information and be a part of the solution of solidarity and not charity. I want to um, quickly just, let's see, share um and make sure everyone knows how to get to various websites we talked about whoops <laughs> we talked about the flagstaff mutual aid uh we also talked about clean up the minds um which is at cleanupthemines.org um where you can learn more about that work and how to spread the word and and uh, be an advocate there. We talked about Protect the Peaks, protectthepeaks.org, where uh, uh, you can learn more about what you can do. And I was going to ask you about the USDA and Forest Service and whether the change of, in the Biden administration and leadership, including, you know, there's an indigenous tribal liaison um in usda now heather don thompson and whether you think that might um help uh efforts to protect san francisco peaks um I'll or if it's just make, more of the same i'll make this short uh tom vilsick was brought back from the, his role in the obama administration to head up the usda under the biden administration and we met with him and his staff and we had no results um so, you know, I don't, I'm skeptical of any governmental, you know, process, administrative process, uh, mainly because, as I mentioned before, they're not designed, you know, for us. I think there's a lot of tokenization that's happening under this administration. I mean, I, I risk saying this controversially that Deb Holland, you know, is, you know, a, a token that's being utilized uh, to pacify a lot of the resistance that was um, fomented. I mean, there's such a, a powerful rage of indigenous people right now that was born out of Standing Rock or activated, not just born there because mm -hmm. it's been going for a long time, reactivated, if you will. And it's growing. It grew in resistance to line three and those fires are not going to go out. And so I feel like there's a bit of a tokenization effort to suppress and manage indigenous resistance that's happening right now with this administration and probably will continue. Um, so I'm very skeptical. Um, I, I you know, tend to uh, want to 
empower and listen to the young folks that are leading a lot of the direct actions now, which is a hard time. I mean, in the midst of a pandemic to want to risk arrest and police violence and in peppers being pepper sprayed. So you have to breathe stuff in and going through that process is a very, very huge sacrifice and in, in risk that people are taking right now. Um, so I, I, I would empower, uplift their voices more than anything. Uh, yes. And, well, and I'm happy to hear um, finally some challenge to authority there and, and whether, um, uh, because there's been such a change, like everyone just kind of took a deep breath and relaxed in the Biden administration with the appointment of, of Deb Holland, like, oh, everything's going to be okay now. <laughs> Um, and I've always felt really uncomfortable about that. So I'm glad, Clee, um, helping. Uh, thank you for giving me um, some words and um, uh, connecting that uncomfortability I've had with, um, uh, you know, as much as we love Deb Holland, um, what that really means uh, to have a, a Native person in a, in a position like that. And, and we have a director of national parks, right? I think right. A, a director right. or something like that. So, so this is the politics of recognition. I highly recommend folks, because we don't have time to talk about this, to read Glenn Coulthard's book um, from so-called uh, Clanada. Um, he wrote a powerful book called Redskins White Mask, which is based off an analysis presented by F Franz Fanon in Blackskins White Mask. And he talks about the different the distinction between the politics of recognition and the politics of liberation. Are we okay just being recognized and having a seat at the table? Or, you know, what do we mean by justice? Uh, what do we mean, you know, like, I, th I think it, it, it's clear when we connect to um, an analysis that's based upon achievable goals like what are our actual goals what are we trying to accomplish um do we want to just you know further facilitate assimilation um and negotiate you know parts that we can salvage of you know the sacred let's say for example or other parts of indigenous existence or do we want to make sure that it's restored and protected and we honor our ancestors and future generations and i think those are the stakes we can't accept anything else and negotiate that away. It's a challenge. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, we, we, I think it's important to get into, you know, the skepticism of that and be skeptical, celebrate the wins that we have, but recognize that if, if dead Helen's going to be in that position, it's not just a moment to celebrate. It's a moment for accountability. It means, okay, what are you going to do with that responsibility? That role? Cause there, this isn't the first time a native person's actually filled. Well, if you look at the history of the BIA and department of interior, Department of Interior was actually part of the Department of War, and it was established specifically to facilitate, you know, the 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 taking of our lands. And all. So there's a huge legacy that we can't just say, oh, just because a Native person's there, that everything's going to be okay. Especially if we look at the Obama or the Biden administration's track record right now in his first hundred days, he signed more oil and gas leases, he approved them, than the Trump administration in his first hundred days. So. You know, we can't just sleep on that. We actually have to be more vigilant. We have to put this in terms of accountability. You know, what what about this is going to actually result in meaningful change? If we're talking about as a situation where there's been a history, a legacy of brutality and violation after violation and violation of our consent. And if we look at the powerful framework of the the UNDRIP, the United Nations Directors for Raising United Nations Direct Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People, which I forgot to mention in, in the options of looking at protecting sacred places, international law is something to use. But under, for example, United Nations Direct Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People is a non-binding agreement that, you know, the U.S. has to actually, even though they signed on to it in the Obama administration, they actually have to agree to its stipulations, which the, the U.N. has never held the, the U.S. accountable and. I would say, I would argue never will be, you will, will unless it's like some kind of PR move. Um, so it's a very limited and, and not a viable strategy, in my opinion, like international courts. We've had those appeals. We've had, you know, international rapporteurs come out and weigh in and say, hey, this is bad. This is a human rights violation. But, you know, does the U.S. care about human rights when they're dropping bombs on, you know, indigenous people and in other nations because they want their oil, you know? Um, and so the point I was getting at is this about accountability and about, you know, uh, free prior and informed consent regarding the framework that was established and articulated through UNDRIP. That is a 
very, very powerful framework, free, prior, and informed consent. That applies across the board to these relations. Let's talk about that around the fire. You know, leave your politician names, leave your offices, all that. Let's sit in ceremony. Let's talk about what the solutions are. If we mean that we want to end global warming, we want to work together, you know, uh, and be in good relationship with each other in mutuality. You know, to me, you know, the, the, the aim here is about, for, for me, if I want to articulate what I mean by indigenous liberation, it means replacing the principle of political authority, which embodies the state, capitalism, white supremacy, colonialism, cis-heteropatriarchy under it. It's upheld, it's the pillars of it. Um, and it's based, it's rooted on domination, coercion, um, and exploitation. So if we want to replace that principle of political authority, to me, the aim is to replace it with the principle of autonomous indigenous mutuality. Um, so think about that. I'm going to, <laughs> I hope everyone else will too. And, and I want to encourage everyone to please, um, uh, head towards those sites uh, that we sent you to, the websites that we sent you to. Uh, you can also learn more about CLE at indigenousaction.org um, and heck, go to his YouTube site, go to cleebanali.com. Um, his Instagram is uh, his moniker, it's cleebanali. Um, uh, check out, learn more. Um, let's keep this conversation going. And let's find a way that we all can come together um, and and find that ceremony and 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 move forward. Um, Clee, I want to thank you for your time and your energy, and I hope you're you're still feeling good. I feel like we could go another hour. Yeah. Well, I, I, I <laughs> forgot to mention my little thing about unity because you said coming together. Sometimes maybe we don't need to come together. You know, sometimes diversity of tactics and having different caps means they can't just break a unified front. So I don't have illusions of like unity on those levels, but I have a, a, an idea and a um, excitement and desire to see a, a good direction that we can move forward that honors those, the, the dreams and the um, uh, sacrifices of our ancestors for future generations and Thank you. Thank you, Clee. Well, um, I'm going to, I'm going to wrap this up and I want to thank everyone, uh, our, our viewers out there, everyone who's been with us, um, and talking in the chat. Thank you for your words, um, and, and your ideas and your comments. Um, again, let's thank, uh, let's, uh, thank Clee. Um, uh, we hear your applause out there. <laughs> Um, and of course, I want to thank uh, our ancestors and our future ancestors um, who continue to guide all of us in this work that we do. Um, of course, I can't, I've got to mention the Association on American Indian Affairs for making um, Red Hoop Talk possible. And really, um, uh, I think we're having another show in two weeks. It's going to be about... Um, uh, peyote and other plant medicines and their overuse conservation and, and some other interesting issues that, that we're going to be getting into. Um, and so until then, we'll see you at the next Red Hoop Talk. Remember that you're sacred and together we can make a difference. And, and thank you all so much for your really strong efforts bringing our ancestors home to rest. Thank you so much for your advocacy regarding sacred lands and education for younger people. I just want to just uplift also the work that you're doing, even though I'll, you know, challenge the nonprofit industrial complex. Um, it's great to see that you all are in that role and ensuring that at least those levels that we can have those strong advocates. So I wanted to just express that, you know, you're looking at a hundred year legacy. So there's a lot of power in that and really want to respect and uphold that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Clee. And good night, everyone. <laughs>